In this video, we're going to be talking about removing lactate from our body after intense exercise. And we're also going to be talking about muscle soreness and what causes it. We have two different ways our bodies can recover from exercise. We can do it um, passively, which basically means you just sit down and do nothing or lay down and do nothing. And then we have active recovery, which typically we call a cool down. Um, there's various reasons why you want to do a cool down. We're only going to get into one of those uh, here in this this uh, video. Um, but in looking at this, uh, we can look at the change in blood lactate over time with a passive recovery, this purple purple line here, and an active recovery, this green line. So you can see that if you do an active recovery, and what's recommended is somewhere between 30 and 40% of your VO2 max, um, and it needs to be low enough in order to fuel the exercise fully with aerobic metabolism, which is why it has to be a pretty low intensity. And of course, this is a little bit higher for you know elite athletes than what it is for non-elite athletes potentially, because um, they're you know their forty percent of their VO2 max is higher for them, but also they might be able to do a little higher intensity relative to their own VO2 max and do it aerobically. But regardless, really low intensity exercise. And it's going to um, sort of push the blood through those muscles and flood those muscles with uh, with fresh blood. And as that blood comes out into the venous side of the of the network, um, it actually carries a lot of that lactate with it, which is how the lactate gets from the muscle cells into the blood and into the bloodstream. And so. When you do that and you're sort of spreading the lactate around the body, it allows the entire body to be sort of in the process and, and, and helping out with the process of removing the lactate from the body. And so we actually remove the lactate a little bit faster when we do this and we do some sort of uh, low intensity cool down. Where if we do a passive recovery where we just sit down, the blood uh, lactate will um, Go, it'll go down over time, but it takes longer because we're not able to use the entire body to convert that lactate into various other products that eventually get you know removed from the system. And so, passive recovery requires a much longer period of time than active recovery in order to bring the lactate levels down. Um, either one, though, regardless of you do a passive or active recovery you know, by two hours or so, or, you know, 100 minutes, to 120 minutes, they're going to be back down to pretty close to resting levels. But if you do an active recovery, you're going to probably be closer to resting levels around an hour, maybe a little less, maybe 40 minutes or so, um, where if you do a passive recovery, it's going to take the hour to two hours potentially to get the lactate levels all the way down because it's constantly slowly leaching out of the muscle, replenishing blood lactate levels um, because you're not flooding the muscle and getting it all out right at the beginning. And so that's the difference between a passive recovery and an active recovery for removing lactate from the body. We're talking about removing lactate and we're talking about this very native connotation. And in a way it kind of is because if you get too much of a lactate buildup, um, in the cell, it can slow down glycolysis, which causes you to feel fatigued and not be able to continue at a high intensity anymore. Um, but lactate itself is not necessarily a dead product. It's not a waste product. Our bodies use the lactate. It's not just thrown away. So 70% of the lactate is going to be turned back into pyruvate, which is what it was before, before it was turned into lactate. And once it's pyruvate, it can just go right into the aerobic metabolism and be used to make energy as it was originally intended when it was pyruvate before it got turned into lactate. And so it basically just gets turned right back into what it was and continues on aerobic metabolism. So 70% of it um, is is dealt with that way. So this can be done within the same cell if that if that muscle cell lowers its intensity level and lowers its uh, glycolysis rates. Um, so if it's able to get the lactate into the aerobic pathway, then that cell will start clearing its own lactate levels. Um, it can also allow its lactate to leak out, and uh, something uh, that's been termed the lactate shuttle means to allow the lactate to leak out of one cell that's producing a lot of lactate, and it can actually leak into another cell that's producing um, uh, not a lot of lactate and basically not producing any lactate. And so the other cell can actually utilize it because it can do this process. It can convert it back to pyruvate and then use it aerobically. And so you can actually um, use lactate from one cell in order to fuel another cell. 
And so as an example here, maybe a fast twitch muscle fiber is going to probably produce, produce a lot of lactate, where a slow twitch muscle fiber isn't going to, and it's got a lot of aerobic metabolism. So the, the lactate can leak out of the fast twitch muscle fiber and slowly sort of leak into the slow twitch muscle fiber and then just be used because it's going to be converted to pyruvate and used aerobically. Another 20% of our blood lactate or our lactate in general, I should say, um, is going to be converted to glucose within the liver. All right, so looking at this diagram here, we have a muscle that's our, our example muscle. It's producing a lot of lactate. It's working really hard. And that lactate is slowly leaking out into the bloodstream where it eventually comes around to the liver. And then within the liver, it's going to be converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis. And so once it's converted into glucose, it can then be leaked back out into the blood and eventually get back to that same muscle where it can be used or a different muscle where it can be used. And so we get this cycle here that is called the Cori cycle. And the last 10% of lactate is just gonna be converted into amino acids and our body is gonna use it in, when it uses proteins to build up structures. Lactate is commonly blamed for causing next day muscle soreness and just sort of lay culture from various coaches and you know, fellow athletes and people like that. And um, so first off, let me just define um, the, the term that is used in order to describe the next day or two days later when you get muscle soreness. We call that DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. So it's soreness that happens 24 to 48 hours after the intense bout of exercise. Power athletes, for example, should be experiencing DOMS on a regular basis because they're doing really high intensity exercise in most of their sessions. Um, where more health-oriented individuals who aren't athletes, you know, you're a 35-year-old who's just going to the gym just to stay in shape, they really shouldn't be experiencing DOMS very often. Likewise, you know, endurance athletes and uh, people like that probably shouldn't be experiencing DOMS very often either. Um, and that's because the intensity of exercise they're doing is going to be a, a lower level than what a, a power athlete's going to do. But let me get back to talking about lactate here. So, Commonly, you hear lactic acid causes DOMS, or uh, if you don't do a cool down, you'll have a lot of lactic acid that's going to cause you to be sore the next day or you know, a couple days later. Um, so let me dismiss that myth in a few different ways here. So it, first off, it's not true, but let's, let's talk about how it's not true or some evidence for why it's not true. So first off, when you measure blood lactate, as we mentioned already, and this is the same figure we saw a couple uh, slides ago, it's gone, basically. It's back down to resting levels within about an hour and a half, two hours or so. And so whether you do a cool down or not, you're not going to have you know, lactate or you know, lactic acid in your body the next day causing soreness. Um, so it's probably not the cause of next day soreness um, just because lactate's gone by you know, way before then. So it's definitely you know, not going to be what's currently causing the soreness the next day. Let's talk about some other reasons why that's probably not true. Uh, so first of all, lactic acid doesn't even exist in the human body. This is something that is commonly uh, said wrong. I've said it wrong several times in myself, it's something I've you know learned more recently. Unfortunately, I've learned more recently, but it's something that um, is in a lot of lay media. It's also in a lot of you know, academic papers and a lot of textbooks where they talk about lactic acid in the body and it's it, what it does and and how it's you know negative for exercise performance and all that kind of stuff problem is our body doesn't produce lactic acid and it's not really capable of producing lactic acid because lactic acid isn't stable at the ph levels of our body and it couldn't be produced that way either so if you look at the uh, reactions happening when our bodies make lactate it wasn't made as lactic acid it was made as lactate and it's actually a good thing because it allows our glycolysis pathway to continue without having a buildup of nadh molecules and a buildup of pyruvate molecules that would actually cause it to slow down much more than what the lactate does and the we're so a lot of people will say okay well where does the acid come from it actually comes from acp breakdown that where the hydrolysis actually produces acids and it produces hydrogen ions that don't end up going into aerobic metabolism uh, but we're not going to go into a whole lot of depth with that here just know lactic acid does not actually exist within the human body it does not get produced Lactate does, lactic acid does not. Um, they're not the same thing. So if lactate or lactic acid is not the cause for next day soreness, what is? 
Uh, so what is actually the cause of next day soreness is going to be microscopic injury to the muscle fibers, so the muscle cells themselves. And so if you look at an example of a sarcomere, this is a sarcomere, um, which is the, the basic structural and functional unit of a skeletal muscle. This is a, a, a picture of that on a light microscope. And we have these various striations, which is the different proteins lining up the way they should. When you go through an intense exercise bout, you actually start to have little tiny tears and disruptions to this, and those tears and disruptions is what eventually causes DOMS uh, through various pathways. And it is, it's still something that's being investigated, um, but through various uh, recovery pathways and, and also the tears themselves, that is the cause of DOMS. And so if you scan this QR code here, it's going to take you to this website. Uh, so you could also type that in there, and I'll put a link to this in the description below. Um, and it's going to be a, a research paper that has a nice image. So go to figure two in that, that research paper, and it's going to show you what the sarcomeres look like. It's a little more zoomed out than this, but it's going to show the, the sarcomeres of a skeletal muscle cell after doing a, some heavy plyometric exercise. You can actually see it's kind of been torn apart in this nice striated appearance is just completely destroyed by intense exercise and, and that is what causes DOMS. It's not caused by lactic acid, it's not caused by lactate. This video talked a lot about high intensity exercise and athletic performance. In order to do those things, we need to be able to make energy in the body. I'm gonna put a link in the description below to a bioenergetics playlist that I've already created, talking about the various energy pathways. And I'm also gonna put a link in the description below to the next video in this series, where I'm gonna talk about how we measure energy production in the body and things like VO2.